Okay, let's get started. Yeah, thanks to the organizers um, and welcome to everybody. Um, they asked me to give the first lecture in the bootcamp, so I started thinking where should I start from. The program is about polynomials, so uh, let's talk about polynomials. Does anybody know who invented polynomials? Who was the first mathematician to actually formulate the concept of a polynomial? There might be some debate about this. Um, uh, one possible answer is Diophantus, so a Roman Empire mathematician, developed a certain notation um, for polynomials, although only up, up to a uh, power of six. So he didn't have, no, they used letters and they only went up to six. And he studied uh, equalities, which today would be called Diophantine equations, uh, polynomials with integer coefficients and asking for integer roots. So in some sense, he was the first mathematician to talk about uh, polynomials, although he didn't really consider them as, an, as a mathematical object. Um, the first mathematician, and I had to look it up, that I didn't know this, who actually defined a polynomial as an object with arbitrary powers, unbounded, x to the n, uh, was a relatively obscure um, Islamic scholar, Al-Karaji, in fact, Iranian, uh, born in Karaj. Uh, and he, he actually defined polynomials um, and general powers of x. As far as we know, he seems to be the first mathematician to actually do that. He was a follower of the more, more famous uh, Al-Gharazmi, who also worked on algebra, but he didn't talk about polynomials. He actually gave solutions to the quadratic equation, among other things. Um, and Al-Karaji was his follower. So this seems to be the first place where actually polynomials appear. Um, in Europe, of course, these were dark ages, and the study of mathematics didn't pick up until the 16th century, let's say, with the Italian school, um, uh, culminating in uh, the resolution of cubic and quartic equations. Cardano published closed form solutions, and he also started talking <coughs> about complex numbers. Um, a follower of Cardano was Francois Biet. I'm mentioning him because he, he was the first one to develop certain uh, equations relating the coefficients of a polynomial and the roots, which will be relevant for this lecture in particular. <coughs> and then Isaac Newton actually took things further and uh, uh, de developed other identities, which are today called Newton's identities. Also, uh, although it turns out that they were actually discovered a little bit earlier by another French mathematician as well. So these are the beginnings. Um, now let me mention uh, the fundamental theorem about polynomials, which is that every polynomial with complex coefficients has a complex root. Um, and that's the beauty of um, the field of complex numbers, that we can take any polynomial and we can factor it into linear factors, break it down into factors of x minus lambda j. So this works very nicely in, um, in complex numbers. Um, but if you ask for real roots, as you, as you know, they, they don't always exist. Some polynomials have real roots, some polynomials don't. Uh, and it's a nice property of a polynomial if all its roots are real. So this is what we call a real rooted polynomial, a polynomial which can be factored into linear factors with real um, and roots, a polynomial of degree n. So there might be multiple roots, that's fine. Uh, but all the roots should be real. Um, graphically, real rooted polynomials behave like this. They oscillate nicely up and down n times, uh, except for the case of multiple roots that we usually have to be careful about in roots and so on. So let me say a few other things. Um, we also know that there's no closed form solution using radicals for polynomials of degree uh, more than four. Um, uh, but roots can be computed very successfully numerically. And what will be useful here are relations between the coefficients and the roots, although the roots themselves cannot be uh, expressed uh, in closed form in general. Uh, there are relations which will be useful for us. So. Um, Remember the, uh, the French mathematician that I've mentioned in the 16th century, Francois Biet, he came up with these relations, which are pretty simple. Uh, just 
directly from uh, the expression for a polynomial as a product of x minus lambda j, where lambda j are the roots, you can derive the following, that um, the coefficient a, a n minus 1 is minus the summation of the roots. And the next coefficient, a n minus 2, is the summation over pairs, of products of pairs of roots. The third one would be a minus summation over triples of roots, and so on. And the constant term is plus minus the product of all the roots. So these are called Biet's identities. Uh, pretty simple. So knowing the roots, it's easy to say what the coefficients are. The reverse direction is more complicated. Uh, what Newton did was he noticed that if you look at the summation of the powers, so certain powers of all the roots, let's say kth powers, this is a quantity that we can actually express in terms of the coefficients uh, in a nice form. So as I already mentioned, the summation of the roots is just minus the coefficient a and minus 1. So here, I'm assuming the polynomial is monic. Uh, there could be some leading coefficient as well, but for now, let's just assume it's 1. Uh, the coefficient in front of x to the n is 1. Uh, so the summation of the roots is, um, is easy. Um, it's just minus a and minus 1. And you can continue like this. So now let's, let's think about the summation of the squares of the roots. How do you express the summation of the squares? Well, so if you take the, the sum of the roots, you square that, the summation lambda j, the whole thing squared, then you will get the squares and also some cross terms. So then we subtract them out. And we know that that's, that's exactly the a n minus 2 coefficient. The summation over pairs of roots, the products of pairs of roots, can be expressed in terms of a n minus 2. So the summation of the roots squared also has a nice expression. It's a n minus 1 squared minus 2 a n minus and you can continue like this. The summation of the roots cubed can be expressed in terms of a n minus 1, a n minus 2, and a n minus 3. And there's a general formula, which is what we call um, Newton's identity. The summation of the roots to the power of k um, can be computed recursively using the coefficients mi that we computed earlier. There's a nice formula. So. Um, so this is something that we can do efficiently. Pretty easy. For every k, we can compute the summation of the roots um, to the power of k. Um, this is a, a useful consequence from the point of view of a computer scientist. You could ask, uh, if I give you a polynomial with real coefficients, can you actually tell uh, if it has real roots or not? Or it's not clear because we don't know how to compute the roots. But there's a nice criterion for um, saying whether the polynomial is real rooted or not. And this is known as the Hermit Sylvester theorem. So if I give you a polynomial, and now suppose it's written in this form a product of x minus lambda j, though well, we don't know what the lambda <coughs> j's are, but the statement is that it's real rooted if and only if a certain matrix is positive semi definite. And the matrix is formed by taking um, these power sums of roots, m, m sub something, m sub i plus j minus 2. And the matrix, uh, such that the entries only depend on i plus j, and you just plug in these power sums. You form this n by n matrix. And then you check whether that matrix is positive sum indefinite. So the claim is that this is if and only if. Uh, this will be actually one of our exercises. So I will postpone it for now, but the, the nice corollary for us is that this is a tractable problem computationally, testing whether a polynomial is real rooted or not. So that's, that's good to know. Now Newton um, noticed a few other um, nice properties of real rooted polynomials. Uh, one is when you look at a real rooted polynomial with non-negative coefficients, or let's say positive coefficients, then they always form a unimodal sequence. So when you look at the coefficients, they go up and then they go down. And not only that, they actually form a log concave sequence. 
the ratios between successive coefficients are monotonic. So this is, uh, this is a phenomenon which appears in different areas of combinatorics. Um, in this setting, it, it's pretty simple to explain why this happens, and we will do it right now. Um, but this actually foreshadows other much more difficult results, which will come up later in this program. The fact that a certain combinatorial sequence is unimodal, or moreover, block concave, when that happens, it usually means something pretty interesting. And in some cases, it's very hard to prove. Um, in this setting, um, Newton actually proved something a little bit stronger. He proved that even when you divide these coefficients by the binomial coefficients, they still form a log concave sequence. So in some sense, it's at least as log concave as uh, the bi binomial coefficients. And the binomial coefficients, of course, would be uh, the coefficients of the polynomial 1 plus x to the n. So that's that can come up in this way. Um, so why is this true? So actually the proof is interesting. Um, so now we have to talk about polynomials a little bit more. So let's say that um, I have two polynomials, uh, polynomial P of degree N uh, and a polynomial Q of degree N minus one. And we say that the roots of Q interlace the roots of P if the roots are ordered in this fashion, that they alternate on the real line. So um, yeah, the picture illustrates how this might happen. When you look at the real line, you will see blue root, red root, blue root, red root, blue root, red root. Some of these uh, inequalities could be actually equalities. That's fine. Um, one way in this might happen, in which this might happen, is that you take a polynomial and then you differentiate it. So let's just think about that. That's, a, that's uh, an easy example to think about and also a useful fact that if P is real rooted, then the derivative of P uh, is also going to be real rooted and its roots interlace those of P. So, <coughs> Uh, let's just think about the case where P has N distinct roots. Multiple roots still work, but you just have to think about it a little bit more carefully. So if P has N distinct roots, then what happens when you look at the intervals between successive roots? Um, for example, here the blue polynomial goes negative, then it comes back to the real line. So it must have an extremal point somewhere between the two roots. So between every two consecutive roots, there must be an extremal point of the blue polynomial, and this extremal point is the root of the derivative, which is the red polynomial, right? So between every two consecutive roots, the derivative has a root. The blue polynomial has n, let's say, distinct roots. So the red polynomial has n minus one uh, distinct roots, one in each interval between two consecutive roots. So this is what happens for the derivative. Um, more generally, uh, this is one of, um, one of the operations that you can do on a real rooted op uh, polynomial, and it still remains real rooted. So this will be a running theme here. What are the operations that you can apply to a real rooted polynomial, and more later, stable polynomials, which I'm not defining yet what they are, but the, the important thing is what are the operations that you can apply to these polynomials? And they still remain real rooted. And taking the derivative is the first such operation. This, this lemma uh, states that this is what you can do. Um, okay. um, with multiple roots, you have to think about it a little bit more carefully, but you will see that it still works. For example, if you have um, root of multiplicity two, then the blue polynomial would just touch the real line. So there are two roots there. And then the derivative would have a single root at the same location. So just think about it and the statement is still true. Let me just skip that for now. Um, another operation that you can do is that you can reverse the order of the coefficients. So you can take any um, 
to polynomial, well, you can do that with any polynomial, uh, with coefficients from a0 through an, and just reverse the order. So a0 takes the place of an, uh, and vice versa. Algebraically, what does that mean? We're taking p, plug in one, o, 1 over x, and multiply by x to the n. So this will, this will do what I just said. It will reverse the order of coefficients. So the claim is that this is another operation which preserves real rootedness. And um, the roots of the new polynomial are going to be just 1 over the roots of the old polynomial. One thing you have to be careful about, what if p has some roots equal to 0? Well, it turns out that those will just disappear. And actually, in that case, the degree of the polynomial will go down. Because if you have, let's say, p, is, p of x is just equal to x, make it simple. p of x is equal to x, then this is 1 over x times x, so the new polynomial is 1. So if, if p has some roots equal to 0, then those will just come out, disappear, and the degree of the polynomial decreases, uh, but apart from that, all the roots of the new polynomial are going to be 1 over the roots of p, which is easy to see just by substitution, right? This is 1 over x here. So, so that's what happens. Um, and if, the, if p has this expression, product of x minus alpha j, then um, the new polynomial is going to be the product of 1 minus alpha j times x. So the new polynomial has, again, real roots. Um, and it has the number of roots corresponding to its degree. The zero roots just disappeared. So the number of roots that disappeared is exactly by how much the degree went down. So you still have all roots uh, real. So it's OK. So this is our second operation that we can perform and preserve real rootedness, all right? So. So now let's actually prove um, Newton's uh, inequalities. And actually, more than the specific proof here, what is important is the idea here. So the idea is that we want to say something about a triple of coefficients. We have a polynomial, OK? And we have this triple of coefficient. We want to do that for every k. But for some particular k, I want to say something about the relationship of a k minus 1, a k, and a k plus 1, OK? Um, so the, the way I'm going to do that is that I'm going to massage the polynomial in certain ways using my operations in such a way that I extract some quadratic polynomial, which has only these three coefficients. So I can say something about them. But the operations that I use are, are exactly those um, real rootedness preserving operations. So Throughout the process, the polynomial will remain real rooted. And this will foreshadow many other arguments that will come up in this boot camp and um, in this area where you want to say something. Um, you want to prove, let's say, that a certain polynomial is real rooted. So start from something that you know to be real rooted and massage it using your operations until you get what you want. And what you, you, what you get um, is guaranteed to be a real rooted or stable polynomial. So let's do it here just to see um, how that might work. So we have this degree n polynomial. Uh, and I want to kill everything except for these three coefficients. So first, let's differentiate it <clears throat> until all the stuff below a k disappears. So just differentiate it k minus 1 times. And this will bring the relevant coefficients to the bottom of the polynomial, the constant term, linear term, quadratic term. And then we have some other stuff above that. Um, and we get some coefficients, which you don't have to worry about too much. Some factorials will come out. Um, now I would like to kill all the coefficients above the quadratic term. Right? So I'm going to reverse the order of coefficients by using the operation that I described. This will bring the, uh, the coefficients that I care about, will bring them to the top of the polynomial, the top three powers, and then we have some junk here that we don't care about. So let's differentiate again until all this junk disappears. So differentiate n minus k minus 1 times. Um, and all that remains is a quadratic polynomial, right? We destroyed 
all the terms up here, uh, and we obtained a certain quadratic polynomial which contains the coefficients that we care about. So now, what do we know? Uh, the only in information and the important information is that this polynomial is real rooted. Because all the operations were preserving real rootedness. And it's a quadratic polynomial, so that's a simple thing. How do you check if a quadratic polynomial is real rooted? The discriminant should be non negative. So just write down the discriminant of this polynomial. There's a bunch of factorials here. You rearrange things nicely, and you get exactly this inequality. This is Newton's inequality. The coefficients divided by the binomial coefficients are log. Um, so, um, so this is the template that will come up later. Uh, now let me talk about something a little bit different. Uh, there's a nice connection between real rooted polynomials and distributions of independent Bernoulli random variables. Um, and this will actually have some surprising uh, implications. So the statement is that a real rooted polynomial with non-negative coefficients um, always captures um, the distribution of the summation of a bunch of independent Bernoulli random variables in the sense that the coefficients AK are just the probabilities that the summation of the independent uh, Bernoulli random variables, zero, one random variables, is exactly K. K is running from zero to N. You have N variables. They sum up to something between zero and N. And the statement is that this is a if and only if. The polynomial is real, root, real rooted if and only if it captures this kind of distribution for non-negative coefficients. Um, so why is this true? Um, again, not too complicated. So if the coefficients um, have this form, if AK is the probability that for a certain collection of Bernoulli random variables, the summation of yj is equal to k, um, then, well, we can write the polynomial in this form, the summation of aj x to the j. So this is an expectation of this expression, is the moment generating function, x to the summation of yj. The expectation of that is exactly my polynomial, right? If the variables are independent, then we can break it down into a product of expectations. And each of these expectations is one minus pj, that's the probability that the variable is zero, plus um, pj times x. pj is the probability that um, the, probabili the variable is equal to one. Right? So it's a product of linear terms, uh, linear factors with real coefficients, so, so it's a real rooted polynomial. That's, that's one implication. And you can also do it the other way. So if P is real rooted, then you can write it as a product. Now it's a real rooted polynomial with non-negative coefficients uh, normalized to sum up to one. I think I forgot to say that earlier. So it cannot have any strictly positive roots, right? It's a polynomial with non-negative coefficients. So all the roots are non-positive. So we can write it in this form. It's a product of x, to x plus bj, and bj are some uh, non-negative real values. These are actually the roots with a negative sign. Um, we also have this normalization, so so the factor in front is just one minus the product of one plus bj. So the polynomial is in this form, product of x plus bj over one plus bj, and that can be viewed exactly as a generating function of the summation of independent Bernoulli variables. Because if you, you set the probability pj to be one over one plus bj, this is exactly what you get. You get x over one plus bj, which is pj, plus one minus this. So it's exactly in this form. It works both ways. So but just remember, real rooted polynomials with non-negative coefficients are exactly the generating functions of summations of independent Bernoulli random variables. Uh, 
this has an interesting implication. Let me say now, um, okay, one corollary is that these probabilities form a log concave sequence by using uh, Newton's inequalities. So that's good to know. Um, there are probably other ways to prove it, but it's, it's a nice fact. Um, now let me, let me say a little bit about uh, some combinatorial situations where real rooted polynomials come up. The reason why, why we are having this semester is that uh, not because some polynomials are real rooted just when you write the formula, but because polynomials that arise in interesting combinatorial situations happen to be real rooted. So let me give you two examples which will come up later in the bootcamp. I'm not gonna prove now that they're real rooted, but um, they're both pretty important. The first example is the matching polynomial. The matching polynomial uh, can be written in different forms. This is what is sometimes called a matching defect polynomial. So in this form, we have uh, for each matching a contribution where you have x to the power corresponding to the number of vertices which are not covered by the matching. So it's the number of vertices minus twice the cardinality of the matching. Uh, and also, the contributions have alternating signs depending on the uh, parity of the size of the matching. So let's call this the matching polynomial and the claim that this is a real rooted polynomial. So now this, this is much less obvious if you state it like that. It's a very interesting fact which will have important implications here. Um, the second polynomial that I want to mention is the spanning tree polynomial. So now I'm doing something maybe sl uh, slightly strange here. So if you just write down the basic spanning tree polynomial, that would be the summation over spanning trees analogous to this, x to the number of edges in a spanning tree, that's not a very interesting polynomial. That's just the number of spanning trees times x to the n minus one. So not too interesting. Um, but the spanning tree poly polynomial um, can be also written in a multivariate form where you have a different variable for each edge. This will come up later because for now I don't, I don't have the uh, language to say what is interesting about it. But um, let's, let's tweak the polynomial a little bit and let's define it in this form. I fix some set of edges F. For example, this could be uh, the edges in a certain cut. Consider a fixed cut. I'll let F be exactly the, the edges across the cut. And the polynomial is going to count the number of edges that each tree has across this cut. So for each spanning tree, I take X to the number of edges that the tree contains in this cut. So this is a polynomial, now a more interesting polynomial, um, univariate polynomial. And the claim is that this polynomial is also real rooted. So again, that's not obvious. The proofs will come up later. Um, so now here, here's an interesting fact. Um, so if you look at um, any graph, take a uniformly random spanning tree. Okay. Now look at how many edges, T, I'm using T for the set of edges in the tree. Look at how many edges this tree contains in a certain fixed set F. Again, for example, a cut. How many edges does it have across this cut? So this is a random variable, right? I have a random tree. It might have different number of edges across this cut. So the claim is that this is actually a summation of independent Bernoulli variables. Now that sounds pretty suspicious, right? Because certainly the edges in a tree don't appear independently. Well, it sounds like a contradiction in mathematics, but actually it's a true fact. So. Uh, the, the Bernoulli variables exist. It's not clear how they're actually related to the edges of the graph, but the distribution exists. You can also always take uh, this random variable, which has a certain distribution. You can break it down as a summation of independent Bernoulli variables. Um, so you can actually say a lot about that distribution. It behaves like, yeah, you have turn of bounds and whatnot. It, it's, um, it's this form of uh, random variable. Although these Bernoulli variables are kind of magical. I don't know if somebody here has more intuition about it. Cheyenne? 
it's a little bit mysterious. What are these Bernoulli variables? Because they certainly don't correspond to the appearance of individual edges uh, in that cut, right? Because those are not independent, generally, uh, for a random spiral tree. Um, but it is true, so let's, uh, let's prove it. I mean, using the fact that the spanning tree polynomial is real rooted, this will be pretty easy. So T sub F is the generating function for the number of edges that a spanning tree has in F. And we can also write the total number of spanning trees as T sub E of one. So the expectation of X to the Z is just one over the total number of spanning trees uh, times the summation of the, over spanning trees X to the um, number of edges that T contains in this particular set F. So it's just the spanning tree polynomial um, subject to F over the spanning tree polynomial. This is just a number. T, uh, T E of one is just the total number of spanning trees. So this whole thing is a, is a real rooted polynomial by the claim that I made, which hopefully somebody else will prove. I think Shia will prove. And um, it's also normalized in the sense that the, the coefficients sum up to one. That's just because when you plug in one, um, you will get one. So it's a real rooted polynomial and it can be expressed, um, the distribution can be expressed as a summation of independent Bernoulli variables. Okay, so I see that I actually went pretty fast, faster than I expected. So we have lots of time for, um, I will slow down now, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have some tricky problems on the homework, on the uh, problem sheet. So um, let's take a quick break. What is the plan? Uh, uh, I think we spend 25 minutes on these and end a little bit and have a longer break. We can do that, yeah. Let's have a little break now, and then we will decide what to do. And meanwhile, look at the problems. We will see how, how this goes. <laughs> 